I would like to um, today just to carry on from last time and uh, I think it's a good idea if I remind you of what happened last time briefly. So I will do this recap on screen and then I will switch back to the blackboard to do some more details and explain things uh, that we haven't had uh, uh, the day before yesterday. Uh, okay, so um, just to remind you of the general setting, we are studying uh, the random Schrodinger equation. So here's the Schrodinger equation with h bar equal to 1. Um, and it's for a single particle. And uh, it's in a random environment. So in, in this famous Anderson model, the particle moves on a lattice. Uh, so the kinetic term is the discrete Laplacian. And then at every lattice site, which are labeled here by this A, uh, there is a potential which is, uh, well, we just take IID random variables, VA, uh, and, and the potential is located at, at X. Um, and for the purposes of this talk, these are going to be Gaussians. Uh, I mean, the, the general theorem is more gen is, is doesn't require this uh, Gaussianity, but anyway, uh, it's easier to explain. And um, okay, so um, it was all going to be at lambda times this potential, where lambda is very small. So one is in the region where one would expect extended states in the Anderson model. And I, I consider three dimensions, or at least three dimensions. Two dimensions as extra singularities, which I don't want to discuss. And uh, as mentioned, there is a, a, a version of this in the continuum. It's called the Lorentz model. Uh, so then the kinetic term is really just the ordinary Laplacian. I mention this because I will sometimes do estimates just for the continuum case, just because it's a lot easier. The lattice case is actually quite intricate in, in some ways when you start doing estimates. Okay, so we then defined the Wigner function, standard object which replaces a phase space density in quantum mechanics. Uh, marginals are the distributions in position and momentum space. And then we, uh, we will scale things, of course, we will scale time and space, and uh, so we introduce also scaled Wigner functions. And uh, one important thing which, is, uh, which we should remember um, is it's very simple. If you also Fourier transform in the x variable, then because then you just get the product of the size and psi bar, and you shift by this uh, extra Fourier parameter here. And so if you rescale, if you do this rescaling, actually you, you shift by epsilon times psi over 2. So uh, the scaling limit is such that that one is very close to having uh, these two arguments equal. And for also for that reason, sometimes I will just uh, show you the estimate when they are equal, and uh, that's a lot easier than just going through the general uh, expressions. Okay, and uh, so the point here is we go to the diffusive time scale, which means uh, the inverse. Um, here is the diffusive time scale, it's written very small, so lambda to the minus kappa minus 2 is the scaling for time, and lambda to the minus 2 minus kappa over 2 is spatial scaling, and uh, as I explained last time, um, then if you test it weakly, so if it, you test it with a test function which uh, is uh, on the macroscopic scale, then you get convergence to the solution of a heat equation with a particular diffusion uh, coefficient here. Okay, and so now let's uh, remember what we then did uh, in more detail. We took the DML formula, or equivalently the resolvent formula, which is uh, written once more here, and we just iterated. And uh, we have discussed this just to, to remind you for today, the nice, uh, if 
feature of this formula is actually that you do have this here in H, so you can iterate to some uh, you know, number of times and then you can stop the iteration. So you can automatically, uh, actually one can rearrange things very nicely. We will see this when we do renormalization, that this is uh, useful. And uh, yeah, and, and, and then of course you can uh, write out these terms. So there are the explicit terms and the remainder term. And the explicit terms only contain H0 and V. So all these uh, quantities are known and the remainder term still contains the full unitary time evolution. And we, if we now uh, insert for the V the objects we had, I here call them VA, um, then obviously this gives rise to a sum over all the different A's and uh, so the interpretation of this is as a collision history, right? The particle goes to site A1 and then it gets scattered, goes to A2, A3 and so on. And uh, it's important to keep also in mind that this collision history is determined before we start doing any averages of a randomness. It's just an independent thing. Okay, and uh, then I r told you that, well, you can uh, delete this unitary from uh, when you take the norm. And so uh, you know that the norm of the remainder is bounded by an explicit term, psi n minus 1 times lambda v. And then you have an integral over time. So you pay basically by a factor of t, which is of course large and has to be compensated by some estimate on this here. And, uh, so this is for the norm, and uh, by a simple Schwarz inequality, one sees that the Wigner function is, uh, I mean, this uh, application to the observable is continuous in the norm, so it's actually useful to estimate these remainders too. So I think this was, uh, yeah, so this we also did last time, so then, then we, uh, we decided to go to momentum space um, simply because uh, the time evolutions are explicit there, uh, just multipliers. Um, in principle, one wouldn't have to do this, but uh, it's of course more convenient here. And uh, since I mentioned all these other, also many body models, um, with Feynman graph expansions. There, when you want to do remainder estimates, you never stay in momentum space. You always do it in position space. But then you have to go back and forth to, to uh, use certain estimates, which we will use here too. OK, so the structure of this formula is it's, it's basically it's a, um, a residue integral. Uh, you move the pole by some eta into the uh, <coughs> complex plane and uh, you get of course when you do the residue e to the t times eta and since we don't want to have any big factor in front we just always choose eta equals t inverse. And uh, so here I still have the potential you can think of this factor as being equal, uh, equal to the random variable times some plane wave in the, in the lattice case we had this too. And then the exponentials of e to the i s h zero get replaced by these propagators. So alpha minus e of p plus i eta. And uh, actually these are the main objects we will discuss afterwards. And okay, so then if we put everything together, we take the Wigner function, which is uh, the um, product of these two um, and uh, there is a collision history for psi and one for psi bar so we have different ends in general and uh, some kind of sequence of uh, lattice sites and now we take the expectation value and uh, since we are assumed Gaussian this will just give us a pairing since we assumed that this local IID this means that uh, these uh, sequences, I mean, if you look at the sets, they have to be identical. 
uh, if there is an up-down pairing. And of course, they don't have to be identical if there is a pairing upstairs or downstairs, like in this graph. So we rewrote this whole thing in, in terms of graphs. And you remember the, the, uh, the idea that these lines here really uh, are, are the, random, the factors of the random variables, which uh, are still there. And uh, the pairing integrates them out, and we get this. Important thing to remember, because it's going to be used all the time now, is that we have momentum conservation at every vertex. So we, we have these momenta, which are integration variables. And you can think of this uh, every, let's say, every value of the integrand as some uh, momentum flow in this diagram. And now we will actually start calculating things. Of course, we, yes. Do you expect the up-down pairing to be special in some sense? I expect what to be special? The up-down pairing. Yes, uh, I, will, I will. Because, answer. say, at the leading order, you will see anywhere the, the pairing. Yeah. Is, uh, uh, um, so the the logic is, of course, th these these are important because they contain these terms, which are. Uh, uh, show up as lost terms, for instance, the Boltzmann equation. I, the, the point of today is that I will, I will, um, well, we will renormalize this expansion. And when we renormalize it, uh, these things become subleading because this is already included. I, I will explain this. And then it's a question of up-down pairings mainly. But of course, there are also uh, objects which are not, uh, you see this pairing here, for instance. You have to show separately that this is small. Yeah? This, is, this is all to come. Yeah? I, you will see how it goes. OK, so, so the, the, the idea now is for, for, for what we're going to do. We're going to look at some graphs, especially at the ladder graph, because this is uh, going to be the dominant contribution. And uh, we will find reasons why other graphs actually have smaller values. And if you remember the last thing I did last time, it was that um, um, we showed that the value of a general up-down graph by a Cauchy-Schwarz estimate is the same, uh, is, is bounded by the ladder graph at, uh, at xi equal to 0. And um, <coughs> so this is, I think, everything we did up to last time. And uh, now let me just discuss a little bit. So I'll go to the blackboard now. Um, and Yeah, so the, the, the essential object is now, I call it C alpha. It's 1 over alpha minus E of k plus i eta. And remember, eta is 1 over t. Oops, I'm sorry. So uh, that was lambda to the 2 plus kappa, <coughs> essentially. I mean, constant times that, maybe. Yeah. Put it here. Oh, I'm, I'm not quite awake yet. Yeah? Oh, what was kappa again? Oh, kappa is positive. Kappa is a positive number, so you can, uh, that is uh, the amount of time we go beyond the kinetic time scale, right? The kinetic time scale is lambda to the minus 2, and we uh, consider times up to the lambda minus 2 minus kappa, kappa positive, so. In the scaling limit, it's actually infinite on a on a kinetic time scale. Mm -hmm. But so far, what what you've done also works for kappa equal to zero. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Um, so the the point about this this propagator representation is if if you remember the the oscillatory representation, of course, you couldn't really use absolute values, and then you have to uh, you can do integration by parts and stationary phases and everything. But if you just want to do bounds by, by uh, absolute values, then, then you lose all this. Whereas in this representation, it, you have a generic 
uh, feature. No, now this, of course, is uh, a function which is, I mean, so far alpha and e are real, right? Alpha is just this integration variable. So this is um <coughs> uh, almost meaning of course that that the supnorm of C alpha uh supnorm means supnorm in K now is of course one over eta. So that's T. The subnorm of this is very large, but it is located now in the continuous case. It's located on a circle with radius alpha. And um, <coughs> in the lattice case, it's of course uh, not just a circle, and this may seem a s uh, sort of a Simple detail. Let me draw it. Draw it here in, in two dimensions. So the two-dimensional version of this uh, uh, symbol of the Laplacian is just one minus two minus cosine k one minus cosine k two, and the level sets of that look a little bit different, right? They look like this. So we have a periodic momentum space, and level sets are in general not convex. They are, they have I mean, in two dimensions they can even be straight lines. If you go to three dimensions, you don't have uh, planes, but you do have uh, surfaces which are vanishing Gauss curvature and uh, all kinds of things. And since we are doing, you know, the, the decay properties of such a thing uh, in position space depend very strongly on this. And so, just to say, the lattice case is a lot. Uh, uh, it's quite a bit different on the technical level when you start doing estimates. It will show up later. Okay, so that is the the sup norm, and of course the one norm. If you look at it, so integral c alpha of k. So it's always the norm in k. Um, <coughs> well. We integrate this absolute value, so it is going to be proportional to log 1 over eta, so log t. Yeah. So uh, the one norm is a lot smaller than the sup norm. If you calculate the two norm of C alpha, um, yeah, well, that's more or less something explicit, and we just so we have this. So uh, we can serves to discuss briefly the density of states. So okay, so this is a um, simple transformation, and you remember the density of states is just. Uh, Whatever some people call it, the co-area formal formula. So it's the usual density of states for this dispersion function, and um <coughs> and so if we are here in this case, then phi of e is proportional to e to the d over two minus one. So it's, it's in particular in three dimensions, we have a square root of E, and the square root will turn up many times. And uh, now here, uh, phi of E, if you really want to calculate it, it's a Jacobi elliptic function, but that's irrelevant. Of course, it is, uh, when you're down here, uh, it looks like E to the d half or uh, d, over d over 2 minus 1. But up here you get logarithmic singularities. So in two dimensions the phi is not a bounded function, but we are going three and higher, and then the phi will always be at least a bounded function, although its derivatives will be divergent at certain points. And um, <coughs> the, as you recall from the formulas we had, we are integrating over alpha, so we cannot fix a single uh, level set. 
And so we, we, we want to have bounds uniform in alpha, so we have to be a little bit careful at this point. Okay. Um, so I was at the two norm, and the two norm is proportional to t if you just do the calculation. Right. Um, so you whatever integrate by parts and estimate sort of it, or you can yeah no. Like no. Sorry. It's like t or Oh, it's t. Let's let's just do let let's just do an upper bound for us. You take the sup norm of phi times an explicit integral, right? So pi over t. Yeah, but is a square of the Oh yeah, right. Sorry, that's the square of the two norm. Yes, yes, it goes like square of square root of t. Yes, I'm sorry. <coughs> Somehow the integration, it's only about the local singularities. Well, that's what mattered, matters most, and that that is also the intuition which one should keep in mind. I mean, we're integrating over k, and the essential uh, the essential region is the vicinity of of this. Uh, Singularity and it's essentially of order one over t. So, so the decay is not relevant. Well, I mean, it is relevant in that you have, if you are in the continuum, you have to integrate over all of space, and then of course the k squared decay is not enough to make it finite. Uh, but in the continuum case, we have these potentials uh, which describe the local uh, random potential and they are uh, assumed to be localized, so they provide the decay. You have to be a little bit careful, but for all the estimates that, that, we, that concern this long time limit, it's always basically a small shell around uh, this level set, which are important. Okay. Okay, so... Um, yeah. And then maybe uh, as an aside, of course, if you integrate the C alpha over alpha, then uh, then uh, locally there is a logarithm of eta again, and the integral is also divergent at, at alpha to infinity, but you always have enough factors uh, to, to have a convergent integral. So we will not go, we're not going to worry about large alphas. So, and... Uh, Basically, um, one can derive from this already power counting for the graphs we had. You remember we had an integration of the k variables and an integration of the k tilde variables, and we had uh, these delta functions for momentum conservation. And that fixed half of the momenta in terms of the other half. So uh, one estimate you can do when you have an, an integral with all these uh, C's is you, when, when you have a very complicated momentum in, in, in as an argument of C, you just estimate by the sup norm, and then the rest of the integrand factorizes into, into independent integrals, so you immediately get an, a, a bound where you have a, a sup norm on, on half of them and a two norm on the other half of them, and that gives you lambda squared t up to logarithms. Yeah, lambda squared t to the n up to logarithms. So that that shows that, or it's an indication that it's it's may, maybe good to to proceed this way to get finer estimates as well. So that would be called uh, ordinary power counting in a field theory. Now, since we have been talking about this, let me make a side remark. Since a side remark, I make it here on the side. Um, I had told you at the, in this grand introduction that there are all these other models where this is also, uh, which, which are also treated by Feynman graphs. And if, if I look at the fermionic uh, now in equilibrium, I had written down an operator of the type d tau minus e of minus i gradient plus mu. So this is the grand canonical uh, ensemble for fermions with a chemical potential mu. And if you have a, 
an inverse temperature beta, then, uh, well, if you go to Fourier space, then this goes to I omega minus E of k minus mu inverse. So this would be the propagator in that case. Omega and k. And so you see it, 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 it has some similarities, but it also has some differences and maybe uh, uh, to, to give a perspective, I, I would like to compare now the two. Um, <coughs> first of all, the variable omega is the dual variable to this variable tau. And the Euclidean time runs from zero to beta, so the omega is actually discrete. Omega is in pi over beta times 2z plus 1. So it's odd multiples of this uh, quantity pi over beta. And then basically 1 over beta plays a similar role as the eta. Yeah, so think of, uh, so the temperature plays the same role as, as, as the finite time. Of course, the, the, the properties of this are slightly different. So if you, first of all, you now have two variables, omega and k. So the omega in contrast to the alpha here, the variable that uh, is associated to, to each line individually. So you have a lot more integrations. And um, you can, of course, uh, calculate, for instance, this here. So this would now be a sum over omega in this set. Let's call this mf. And that actually gives you the function that Mathieu wrote down yesterday to the beta e of k minus mu plus 1. And uh, so when you do the integral over c hat, um, if you integrate the whole thing over k, you get what he had, I th think he called it rho zero of mu. So that's, uh, that's a relation to, to this uh, free Fermi gas, which one had before. And actually, the, the analysis of many fermion systems at weak coupling goes via, uh, well, Feynman and cluster expansions of, of this, uh, with this propagator. Now, if you, if you look at the one norm of this c hat, it's actually infinity because of this uh, um, slow decay at infinity. Uh, that, that can be cured uh, by, actually, you don't even need to renormalize it. You ha just have to rearrange it. But let me just say this, the two norm of c hat squared uh, is finite and it is proportional to log beta. And uh, this is the logarithm of the BCS uh, transition. So this logarithmic behavior. So it, it comes out of the two norm and the two norm is the value of a graph that looks like this. So there are many similarities between these equilibrium models and, and the thing we study here. There are also some very strong differences. I mean, this is, uh, as I said, in the equilibrium there, the mu, for instance, is fixed. You always look only at the singularity at, uh, at a single level set. So that's usually called the Fermi surface because it's a surface in three dimensions. It's called dimension one. In, in general. And, um, and of course, I mean, it's a many particle problem. So you don't just have two lines, but you have uh, more complicated graphs. But there is a certain relation with this. There is also an analysis which then goes around this singularity set. And uh, the simple L1, L infinity bound, which I mentioned just without even writing it down here, is used a lot in this set setting here too, but uh, then it's used in a, in a more refined way doing multi-scale analysis and then it becomes very useful. You get very fine estimates with that. Okay, so just this as an aside. Um, 
So now let's get back to yeah to something in detail. Let me show you a calculation for the ladder graph. So now we look at this graph here. Okay, so now um, remember we we feed in a k0 and a k0 tilde here, and let's just uh, calculate it where these at the value where these are equal. So k0 equal to k0 tilde. Maybe I'll write it explicitly. Yeah. Now we know that momentum conservation holds at every vertex, and then this implies that this k1 is the same as the thing down here. Yeah, because uh, well, whatever comes down here, it gets the same k0 back, and we get k1 here, k2, k2, and so on, kn. Well, kn should be up here. Yeah. So you see uh, the very simple structure of this graph is that it propagates this um, the k's through, and that not surprise will not surprise you now that that if you consider a single building block of this a single rung of this ladder then uh, you will be able to rewrite it in terms of that and uh, what comes out without writing too much on the board okay so one has e to the two eta of t uh, from this uh, it's prefactor lambda to the 2n, since every interaction line gives us a factor lambda squared. And then we have our d alpha d beta, e to the i times beta minus alpha. And then we have this product of propagators. Let me now just right now arrange it in the way uh, when you have identified Oops, just to contract complex here to the power n minus 1. And then there is a, um, a last piece where these, uh, the wave functions are attached, right? C alpha of k0, C beta of k0 bar. And uh, so we still have an integral over this. Yeah. Yeah. And so you see, you can just, uh, if you can evaluate this uh, simple integral here, then you know what the function is. So let's see what this gives. Yeah, so it's some calculation, right? And uh, maybe I'm not sure I, I, I want to do it in great detail because it's just an elementary thing. Um, what comes out here is you, you know, the most important thing is that you get something um, non-zero. Yeah, so you get. Let me just put real part uh, minus i times something like phi of alpha plus phi of beta over alpha uh, beta minus alpha minus two i eta. So this is uh, one of the pieces, uh, this is uh, the single integral which you get. So now I, I'm just telling you, you just plug this in, right? And you, and you use this density of states uh, representation. And so then you just have a one dimensional integral and you just verify that because of uh, the way things arrange themselves with the, in the imaginary part, this is actually a plus. So there's no cancellation. Uh, you really get something non-zero. And uh, now we have to take this um, to the power n minus 1. And let me not write out the whole thing, but what we, what we get here is then uh, an integral d alpha d beta e to the i times beta minus alpha. 1 over beta minus alpha minus 2i eta to the power n. So in this case, it's n minus 1 uh, because this last integral is saved. We save it also to have a 
convergent alpha integral afterwards. And now this, uh, and here we have, of course, um, let me just put it in phi alpha plus phi beta to the power n minus 1. And here we have a lambda 2n minus 1. So we say if 1 lambda squared back here. Okay. And uh, so this you do by residues and uh, turns out to be lambda squared t to the n minus 1 over n minus 1 factorial. So the bound we had before really saturates here. Yeah, so so Manfred, I'm sorry, yeah. you said the last integral is safe, but there's still alpha and beta, so is this... Oh, but with the beta integral, you know, you, 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 you integrate in the variable beta minus gamma. Here you have plenty of decay, right? Okay. So, um, it really is lambda squared t to the n over n factorial if, it's, uh, if, you, if you do the last integral as well. So it is really that big, and uh, that okay. That is the dominant contribution on the kinetic scale, but you also see that this is going to be with this. It's going to be impossible to to make t any larger than one over lambda squared because obviously these things are going to blow up, and uh, <coughs> now. Before we uh, discuss this further, we would like to see what happens when we don't have the ladder graph, but we do basically the same. But we cross the first two. And if you cross the first two, then, of course, obviously all the stuff back here remains the same. It's just uh, uh, n minus 2 instead of n minus 1. But uh, the crossed piece uh, has a different momentum structure. If I have k0 here and here, if I go through this block, I will have k2 here and uh, here as well. This doesn't change. But if I have k1 here now, then I will have something like, uh, what is it, we orient it this, this way, k2 um, plus k1 minus k, no, k0 minus k1, something like this. So, um, which means that now, um, now we are looking at this integral c alpha, of k1 c beta of q minus k1 bar the k1 and the q is still dependent on the other integration variables so it's k2 plus k0 if I'm not mistaken okay and uh, So let me state this is a little lemma. If you look at such an integral, so uh, of course, but um, it doesn't matter k1 minus q and now take absolute value dk1. Then this is bounded by constant times. Um, yeah, and now it turns out eta to the minus b over p plus eta. And um, so, first of all, b is equal to 0 uh, for e of p equals p squared. And b is somewhere between 1 half and 3 quarters for uh, lattice uh, 
Yeah. Um, and uh, this triple norm of P is P for continuum. And uh, on the lattice case, it's uh, P, the uh, minimum of P minus, and then there are these vectors pi hat J. Um, I don't know how many there are. Uh, so these are these vectors, which you see here. Uh, so it would be these. Okay, so you have some periodicity, so you have to worry about this, uh, these vectors here. So again, this is a, a specific uh, lattice uh, feature, but let's, let's just think simply, think continuum, so then this is bounded by a, a constant times 1 over p plus eta. So, yes? yes? Um, the p in your formula on the right, is it supposed the to be q. the q? The yes, it's supposed to be the q. Thank you. Um, so what it tells you is that, that uh, um, if you compare it to the, the ladder diagram, the ladder diagram I told you somewhere up there, you know, it was the two norm of the C alpha squared. It was one over, um, <coughs> what do I, did I do here? This is terrible, terrible nonsense. Um, Okay, so this is pi over eta, yeah? So this is proportional to t. Uh, so this is very large. Uh, sorry. Um, and uh, so... So basically when you... I if, we had, if we calculate this or do the... <laughs> we get a t here and you see the t is absent. Yeah? You pay for it by uh, a singularity at q equal to zero. Uh, and uh, most of the time, so but you, you gain a huge factor, right? t is uh, uh, factor 1 over t is essentially lambda to the 2 at the moment and lambda to the 2 plus kappa later on. Um, and um, yeah, so this is, this is what one would call improved power counting, or we call it crossing estimate. Um, so it's a gain from the indirectness of the collision. The collision history has a crossing, then you gain a factor of 1 over t. And uh, the, the, um, the name of the game is to get as much of that as possible. That, that is basically the strategy of, of, of this proof. Okay, so... Um, yeah, let me see. So I will, I, will not, I will not actually calculate this now, but uh, obviously it is down by a factor. So the question is what, what happens when I, when I insert, let's say, 1 over k2 plus k0 in the next integration <coughs> there. Uh, so I have to revisit one of these integrals up there, and it actually uh, doesn't uh, uh, create a problem because we're in three or more dimensions. We can, we can handle that, but you see that this is a dimension-dependent statement. So on the other hand, when we go through large graphs, we have to be very careful that these things don't pile up, which could also be possible. Um, piling up meaning we have many factors with the same Q. Okay, let's look at the time. Oh, okay. So, yeah, is there any question up to now? So th then you end up with a classification of these graphs and you would just count the number of crossings. Uh, yes. Essentially, that's that. There are many, many technical details uh, which I will only mention in passing. 
but uh, let me let me. Uh, this is what I will discuss in the in the second half of today still. So uh, maybe before I was intending to take a, a, a break or give you a break. Um, let me see where are we. I think the the thing I should now discuss a little bit is um, the. Just for a second, what happens if we actually have this situation here? Um, this one can simply, uh, of course, uh, this low order graph one can simply calculate. And uh, maybe let's do the calculation of this graph after the break. Um, it will turn out to be, again, just a, a non zero contribution. And now let's see what happens when we actually string them together on one side. And that means we get whatever the value of this is. Let's call this, uh, let's call it G for the moment. And then uh, it depends, of course, on alpha and on K. Actually, I think we called it theta. So let's just stick to theta. Um, <coughs> and uh, so if you look at such a graph, then we will have some integral over alpha, and we will have C alpha of k. I mean, momentum conservation obviously tells us it's always the same k that goes through here from beginning to the end. And on every intermediate line, it's also the k, the same k. So what we will get is we will get some uh, C alpha to the k to some power. And, um, well, it's basically what do we get if we have n of these? We have this times theta alpha and k to the power n, and then we get another c alpha of k. And again, you see this, of course, uh, if, you, if you sum just this subset of graphs, you will also get a geometric series. And if the theta does not vanish when we are on this singular set here, an almost singular set, then this is going to be large. Yeah? Because this is a very high power of a singularity. That's basically, it will give, it will give a similar factor to that one. Yeah? And uh, do you have a question? No, you can finish your sentence. <laughs> okay. Um, so and so this this is the essence of uh, what we will do uh, uh, is after the break is we will resum these things except we will not do it with any uh, a questionable geometric sum but we will just re rearrange our expansion point and and then uh, this will end up being. Uh, it will end up the following way. These things will still appear in the new expansion, but they, yeah, this is my break signal. Okay. Um, these things will, of course, still appear, but they will appear in a, in a renormalized form, so in a subtracted form. And uh, the ladders will get, I mean, every line that I've shown you here, which was one of these, is going to be something else now. Um, a renormalized propagator. And um, because of the properties of that new propagator, uh, the estimates change. So the ladders no longer blow up with this new propagator, they no longer blow up on that scale. But they remain order one on this larger time scale. So the idea is now to rearrange uh, the expansion such that um, these things become harmless, these things become order one on the longer time scale, and then, uh, and then these, uh, we, we will start tracking these crossings. And we'll do that. I, I, let's have a five minute break and then continue. Okay. Now let's talk about renormalization. Um, so this is only the, I mean, one is fortunate in this problem 
due to all the other complications that one in this scaling limit one also only has to do the simplest the so-called lowest order renormalization um, in, in, in this field theoretic uh, many body case you have to do renormalization uh, of many more terms um, <coughs> so uh, we had this uh, these two point diagrams right and let me call this uh, so the value of this diagram let me call it theta eta of alpha and p okay so in, in, in our lattice setting this is just the p over alpha minus e of p plus i eta and of course I mean this function is simple enough that you can uh, say ab about basically all of its properties uh, let me maybe um, <coughs> yeah, I shouldn't put a P here, I should put a K here, otherwise it's... So as I wrote it, it doesn't even depend on, 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 on P, but let me put it B of K minus P absolute squared here. So in the continuum, which actually I use for, for doing bounds because it's uh, less complicated, um, you would have a, a certain shape of your potentials and then this is the Fourier transform of that shape function. And um, <coughs> yeah, um, a simple object and the most important thing is that its imaginary part is negative. Yeah. And uh, so let me just list a few properties. Again, some little lemma. Um, <coughs> so we have theta epsilon of alpha and p minus theta epsilon prime of alpha prime and p is bounded by a constant times epsilon to the minus one half epsilon minus epsilon prime plus alpha minus alpha prime. And this is for epsilon bigger than epsilon prime. <coughs> one more, one question. Yes? Yeah. So I'm trying to, to get the big picture a little better. So yeah. the point is in a way that, um, I mean, basically, if one writes it down naively, all diagrams are large. Uh, can, can, I, can I continue for 15 minutes and maybe then you have the big okay. picture? Okay. okay. I, I'm sorry, I start so technically, I just wanted to list the properties we, we want for, of this function. So, I mean, this means that it's, it's uh, well, it's Hölder continuous in these uh, variables, uh, but it's in general, in, in especially in three dimensions, you have to be a little bit careful when you differentiate it. Um, <coughs> in particular, when we do a Taylor expansion, we actually don't get the full power, as, as you will see, but only a fractional power. So uh, to, since I want to tell you the truth, I wanted to mention that. Um, and then one can just uh, calculate it. And uh, let me just say imaginary part of theta of p is uh, less than zero. And uh, let me put it this way and uh, this is bounded by some constant times the minimum of p to the d minus 2 and p inverse so at large p it goes to 0 as well and uh, okay so this is really not Mm, this is elementary uh, stuff, right? So let's just uh, think of theta a of alpha and p and integrate here again over the e's with the density of states. Um, and then we have 1 over alpha minus e plus i eta. And then we have uh, the average of the b hat uh, over the level set E. Um, and uh, 
Okay, so then you remember if you take the limit eta to zero, the you get a, a standard distributional identity, you get a principal value for the real part and, and you get a delta for the imaginary part. So in particular for the imaginary part, when you take eta to zero, uh, you just get, um, you just uh, focus E on alpha, so if you, if you take imaginary part theta, eta, alpha, beta, and take eta to zero, uh, then you get something like phi of alpha, maybe times pi times this average. And uh, <coughs> well, phi of alpha, as you know, is proportional to alpha to the d over 2 minus 1 and then you get uh, you get this factor p to the d minus 2 here. Um, so excuse me, I'm completely lost. Why this this theta now depends on beta? Why it now depends on? On beta. Uh, yeah, it <laughs> wasn't supposed to depend on beta. <laughs> I'm sorry, this is still the same p as before. <laughs> I don't know what I write, so I'm sorry. Um, um, and so the, the, the right hand side doesn't depend on P? Well, it depends on P via this. Uh, okay, option. so then that's just in the So um, it's a function with a negative imaginary part, and you, you uh, of course, uh, it's order lambda squared. Yeah? So the important thing to remember is that you have lambda squared times theta. And to say it right away, of course, um, we have this thing still up there on the first board. Yeah. So this is going to be bigger. Yeah. Of, of course, not everywhere, because at p equal to zero, again, we get something that vanishes. But most of the, for most values of p, yeah, except the vicinity of zero, this thing is going to be much bigger than that. Yeah. And now we rearrange the expansion to make use of this. So, we do a rearrangement in the following way. Um, we define, so rearrange in the following way. We define omega of p, e of p plus lambda squared theta of e of p and p. Yeah, so this is now, we just add a function of um, of p to e of p, and now um, we define our Hamiltonian H zero. Well, H zero is uh, if you want H zero tilde psi out of p is just supposed to be multiplication by omega of p. Right. So, and we take this as an expansion point. So we now write our h, which is still h0 plus v. We write it as h0 plus tilde plus v tilde. And so what we add to the h0 to get h0 tilde, we will subtract from here. So the v tilde is v minus this, uh, let me just write it lambda squared theta. And now we, we repeat the whole expansion. Yeah. We didn't uh, use any, uh, well, we used some properties of h0 before. I mean, h0 was supposed to be self-adjoint, of course, so that we don't get any problems. But you see that the, um, the, uh, the imaginary part of this contribution has the correct sign. 
it will make e to the i s h zero a bounded operator yeah. e to the minus i s h zero because the imaginary part we add is also negative it's most easily seen in the in the uh, alpha representation. So now we put alpha minus omega of p plus i eta. So now we have replaced the e by the omega and if you just think of this then this is basically one al alpha minus um, e of p uh, minus real part of omega, uh, yeah, real part of theta. And then you have plus i eta minus imaginary part of theta times lambda squared. And since this is a negative quantity, this is actually positive. And we make the imaginary part, for most p, we make the imaginary part significantly bigger. And that is the reason why then, on the larger scale, when we now do all diagrams with this bigger uh, um, imaginary part down here, things will still work. And uh, you probably said this and I missed it. So do you keep the eta? So when you say you renormalize, this you do for positive eta? Yes. So there's a theta sub eta up there in the... Yeah, uh, uh, this is, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, it was sloppy. So um, it's supposed to be theta of alpha and p, so it's the limit. So you take the limit and you renormalize with a limit, not with a finite eta. Yeah, with a limit. But you see, that's why I wrote down this this technical looking lemma. I mean, you, you have enough uh, regularity to bound the difference. And so now what, what happens here... Okay, so now, now repeat the expansion. So this is my, and I still call it C alpha of P, sorry for the uh, abuse of notation, but we repeat the expansion with the new C, and um, yeah, and of course the structure of the expansion doesn't change, obviously, and uh, <coughs> the question is what have we gained? And now, um, well, it's just the fact that if you calculate the ladder diagrams with this propagator, so we repeat this calculation which I did before, that you see that it's order one on on this long time scale. Yeah. It's this is not a short calculation, but it is true. I will not. Uh, I don't think I will have time to do that calculation now. So it, it turns out that the ladder diagrams are order one on that scale and uh, <coughs> do I have it here somewhere to write down at least when you say on that scale it's on the lambda minus two or lambda minus two minus k let me write down what one has so uh, if you take this integral lambda squared dp over alpha minus omega of p plus r plus i eta and beta minus omega p minus r conjugate complex minus i eta so no absolute values here <coughs> and you take the soup over the alpha beta and r that's uh, well, minus one less than order constant lambda to the one minus order kappa. So this would be a single uh, rung of the ladder and um, now this integral becomes one. Now um, I should say how this renormalization now really works when, when, when we expand and for this unfortunately I have to go back now to the 
original expansion and I don't really want to write it on the board but just let me remind you that we, we have this diagram with all these uh, A1, A2, A3 and up to An and uh, <coughs> now if we expand again we will again after pairing produce such terms but you note that now we are expanding in V tilde so this is a sum over A of these phi A times whatever B, B of X minus A and then we still have this one term lambda squared theta so in every sum there is another index yeah? so we are sum over Z D uh, uh, union a, a particular index so we, we, we have now an insertion of lambda squared times theta um, in every order of the expansion so if you think of having a collision history of, of this type and you go to a n plus 1 then there are two possibilities either a n plus 1 so these are now labels in Z D um, well if it is equal to a n yeah, then you know you must get a pairing here in one of the terms after taking the expectation value but on the other hand we did have the lambda squared theta term here also in the uh, in the nth order of the expansion so we keep these two together if a n plus one is equal to a n so we automatically s can group them in the iteration of the Duhamel expansion so that we actually get uh, something where this now is minus um, with alpha equals E of P because that's what, 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 this, uh, what this rule says we, we localize the, the theta alpha equals E of P and that means um, so essentially we now have something of the type C alpha of P and then we have uh, the value of the gate theta eta of alpha and P minus theta of E of P and P and then comes the next C alpha of P right? and uh, so we by this arrangement we, we get a subtraction directly in this term and then of course you, you, you do a Taylor expansion yeah? and the Taylor expansion gains us, well it doesn't gain us a full power yeah, because uh, we only have this uh, estimate up here but it gains us half a power so I, I, effectively one gets a t to the minus one half because of this cancellation yeah. so not only are these uh, terms not large anymore they actually uh, get small suppressed in the limit and uh, yeah so that that is essentially the bigger picture is is this big enough for you or yeah uh, yeah I'm, I'm just thinking <coughs> in the back of my head I mean so it's a kind of a I mean it, I mean there's a cancellation coming from the new propagator and the new propagator is a one loop correction yes it has a it has a we would call it a, a Hartree-Fock correction, right? Hartree-Fock is exactly summing such diagrams plus tadpoles yeah. and uh, tadpoles don't appear in this theory but um, yeah it's, it's, it's the simplest type of self-energy renormalization you can have and it's sufficient for that time scale now um, so far I have only well, I've claimed this statement about the ladder. I have uh, shown you how one renormalizes, but now one has to go through the entire expansion again, and one actually has to look at these crossing estimates because we still have n factorial diagrams at every order n. And so the procedure is now one defines uh, a number of um, 
rules for this expansion. Um, yeah, now let me do the graph estimates first and then to talk about the rules for the expansion because the rules for the expansion are not completely uh, simple. So let me just see. Okay, so I, I've, I've drawn here uh, one of these graphs. Um, so I, I've not written so it's okay, zero, K1, K2 and so on. And you see we have some kind of pairing here and it's a pure up-down pairing for the reasons that I just discussed before. And uh, now we want to know what its value is. So the first of all, we associated a permutation to this graph. And the permutation is, uh, well, I mean, obviously you just look, I mean, we, let's keep the convention that we are, take the index on the left. So if this is one, so this then goes to three and uh, three goes back to um, one and so on. So this is just the graph of the permutation drawn upside down. And um, <coughs> now there is uh, the Kirchhoff rule for the momenta. Let me see if I can show this here. Um, so for instance, we have this momentum number one here. And uh, if we want to know which of the factors, so remember here we have the alphas and here we have the beta. Um, which of the beta propagators depend on, on, on this? Well, we just have to draw the loop around here and read off that 3, 2 and 1 depend on, on this uh, on this k, right? And similarly, if we, for instance, uh, look at number 5, yeah, it goes this way, flows this way and back, and we know that the whole uh, row between 3 and 6 has to be depend on k5. So that's, that's just uh, momentum conservation rules. And uh, they are very nicely um, codified in, in, um, in this matrix here. And you see that this matrix just means when, whenever you have such a column here, let me just try to show this again, when you have this column here, then you have these entries here. Yeah? So you can identify this uh, at, at this point. And, uh, so the, you get a matrix for the, for the number two. Actually, if you look at the two, it, uh, if, if you go from here, it goes against the direction. So you get some minus ones as well here. And that, that is basically the, the first organizing principles, you don't look at graphs anymore because, it, of course, obviously it gets too complicated. You just uh, look at this. Oh, I see this is barely visible. Okay, well, anyway, I hope it's clear. Um, so you, you organize this in terms of permutations and uh, the associated matrices here, which tell you which momenta depend on what. And that now allows us to uh, easily write down the graph amplitude. So here is here's the amplitude of this graph. So we have all this uh, stuff in the first line, which you don't have really have to look at. That sort of uh, this comes from this representation, beta, alpha integrals, and the stuff that sits with the size and on the other side with the observable. And here is the core of the graph between 1 and 7 with these propagators C alpha and C beta. And uh, <coughs> so here there's still the pi in delta pi that was the, the product of delta functions. And now we have worked out these delta functions and we get all these um, uh, propagators here. So the kj's are the integration variables and the beta propagators get their momenta fixed exactly according to this rule here or according to this matrix. So you can read this matrix if you want to know what k tilde 3 is. You just sum up the momenta with these signs here and you get this uh, lengthy looking expression somewhere here. Right? Oh no, 
Yeah, this one should be it. And um, <coughs> okay, and now one one important thing I have to mention is I showed you this indirectness estimate. It must be here somewhere. No, not probably not here. Yeah, I think I erased it, um, but I can probably get it back here. Well, anyway, you know this integral way we, where we had a shift, a shift by momentum Q where uh, it actually was much smaller than, than when, when there was a total overlap. We have this 1 over Q. Now, you, you could think of doing this estimate with more than one factor of extra factor of C. Yeah? Say you have five propagators and you see in general here in, in this expression things do, uh, I mean, of course, lots of these Cs depend on uh, any particular kj. Yeah? But if you start doing estimates with, with more and more of these propagators, you, you lose track of the singularity which you get as attached to this improvement. It, it is on some hypersurface which at least we don't know how to characterize. So we want to stick to having only one C beta in each of these in loop integrals which we, uh, where we use the improvement. And obviously this is not in this form yet. Yeah. And so that's where the, 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 the whole algorithm for, for doing this now becomes interesting because you have to decide what to do to, to separate these k's. And uh, well, you remember th that you can still um, you can still uh, bound some of them by their subnorm. Yeah, you get a factor of t, but okay, you get small factors too. And uh, this is what's done then. So I, I, I don't have time to go into the details. Basically, the algorithm is you you remove those. Uh, um, you remove, you, you estimate those propagators by a subnormal which are above any of these peaks. And uh, then one can prove that uh, it actually works when you work from the bottom up from these valleys that you get enough that you can use every other integration momentum to get a small factor. Except if you have lattice, because there you already know that you don't gain anything. Now this graph is such that it doesn't have a ladder substructure, but you could think of placing a ladder in between any of these lines or parallel to any of these lines and you will have to dig them out. Now fortunately in the, in the permutation representation the ladders are very simply described. They're basically uh, those uh, indices where you just advance or go back by a single step in the permutation. And uh, what one then does is one defines, let me see, where is it? One defines a... How, sorry, yeah? how do you, you say you, you can artificially put extra lines to make a ladder, but how many do you put? To no, no, no. Uh, you, uh, maybe I said it wrongly. This is just an example graph, and okay, I, I threw up this example yesterday, and when I had drawn it nicely, I, re I, I realized it didn't have a ladder index inside. So you can just uh, you can just uh, can draw you one where there is a ladder inside. If you don't have a ladder, you leave it, and you renormalize it as it is. Uh, what do you mean I renormalize it as it is? Now, uh, the renormalization is done by changing the propagator. Yes. Now, these are just estimates of the diagrams. As the, there is nothing, you, you have a diagram and you estimate it. Okay. Um, so, I mean, you could, you could uh, also have, for instance, something like this. Uh, whatever. Uh, yeah. And then, obviously, you have... Uh, you, you look at the substructure of these three parallel lines and they are actually a ladder. And you see it in the graph of the permutation that this is just uh, something which goes down step by step. Or it could go up step by step. And uh, whenever you have this substructure, I've already shown you that, that the momentum structure is such you, you don't get any, can't expect any gain from there. So you have to take them out. Yeah. 
In other words, you don't have to take them out, but you cannot, you don't have a gain from them. So basically for the ladders, for the estimating remainders, you just use the, 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 the 1 over eta estimate or 1 over eta plus imaginary part estimate. And so this is what's, what's written here very briefly on this transparency. Um, one defines a degree of a permutation as the number of the non-ladder indices. And uh, the statement is then that the value of any Feynman graph, this permutation is bounded by lambda to some positive number times this degree. That is the, the gain one can get by this uh, iterative uh, um, integration. So basically you're fixing your permutation uh, for the degree. You say um, um, n minus d of sigma indices are ladder indices, so they are progressive sequences. Uh, and then of course you can easily estimate that the number of those which have degree d among all permutations of n elements, it's 2n to the d instead of 2n to the n because the other, uh, other ones are not really uh, factorial because they are progressing uh, linearly. And then, uh, well, it's a little bit like, yeah, we'll not draw any comparison. You, you can just then look, uh, if you sum over graphs of a certain order n with a degree at least d, you can simply verify by um, doing, let's say, entropy estimate and activity estimate, if you really want to think of it this way, um, you see that you get a convergent um, uh, sum and uh, you find that as long as you um <coughs> Well, as long as the lambda is bigger than uh, this, a little bit bigger as the kappa, uh, then you have uh, then this, the sum of all these Feynman graphs is small, and and that's of course where uh, where the uh, the restriction on kappa comes from because if you want to prove this, you have to know what gamma is, and the gamma is for various reasons uh, rather small. Some of the reasons are that, as I told you, if you do the indirectness estimate, for instance, on the lattice, it's a lot worse than in the continuum. Yeah? You, you still have this negative power of eta, and uh, you have to, uh, well, then the gamma just becomes smaller and smaller. Okay, let's see. Yeah, and then there are many other technical points and so I haven't discussed them in any detail. So first of all, I've just told you that one can integrate and collect these uh, indirectness estimates, but every one of these small factors comes attached with a point singularity. Yeah. So you have to keep track of these. That influences the algorithm that makes the gamma smaller. Then one has to have stopping rules for the expansion and the stopping rules are that, um, well, part of them are, are relatively simple. You classify these um, collision histories. In every step when you expand, you ask whether you have a repetition of an index. If it's an immediate repetition, you do this renormalization. If it's a non-immediate repetition. So for instance, if A1 is equal to A3, then we know it has to get paired in one contribution later, but that gets a small factor. That's a separate proof with, uh, with a similar estimate like the indirectness estimate. And um, so one does an expansion where one decides beforehand uh, to um, split things into sequences with repetitions and without repetitions. So that is, uh, it's not a problem because, uh, because one separates the, the expansion and collision histories from actually taking 
the expectation value. But then you remember from the day before yesterday, I gave you this tedious calculation for showing that there is this momentum conservation when you average over randomness. And that required that you sum over all A's and not just non-repeating A's. So you get some additional uh, error terms from that. And uh, this, is, uh, this is a typical exclusion uh, condition which is dealt with by uh, um, polymer type expansion. Makes it a bit more complicated, but it's not, it's not interesting, let's say. OK, in general, uh, one, uh, we can deal with non-Gaussian randomness. I will not discuss this here. The higher moments uh, are yeah, actually easier to bound. And then there is one really nasty technical thing is that the, the dispersion relation on the lattice has non-convex level sets. I think I have a drawing of level set. Yes, here. That's a typical uh, level set of in, in three dimensions. Level set meaning this part down here is not is not part of it. Yeah, it's just the just the stuff that's uh, above the, the lowest plane drawn here, and um, and that makes this indirectness estimate uh, quite a bit harder. I mean these these non-convex Fermi surfaces or, or sur level sets. They also have a big influence here in this equilibrium problem. But at least there, uh, it's always the same level set. Whereas here, we have this alpha parameter, which you have to integrate. And so it runs through all the level sets, and every bad case is included. Uh, so one has to work a little bit more to get this um, controlled. OK. Well, basically, uh, yeah, this I don't show anymore. I think this is the end of the review of this work on quantum diffusion. And uh, according to my original time plan, I still wanted to do another topic, which would be probably another two hours. Um, so let me just say a few words. Um, to um, end, we switch on the light again. Um, OK, so there is the question of still longer time scales. Um, I haven't given it too much thought. There are, there are diagrammatic approaches based on, on physicists' works. Uh, there's a paper by a Japanese uh, physicist Hikami, who uh, uh, did a resummation of, of diagrams for longer time scales. He didn't formulate it in terms of time scales, but for the localization problem. But uh, actually, in, in, in the physics um, community, most people switch to a, a nonlinear sigma model description of this um, localization problem, which is due to Franz Wegener and which was much developed over time. And uh, yeah, I, I think I have nothing to say about that sigma model. It's a very interesting and very difficult model. It's a sigma model with a non-compact target space. Um, the other question is about the if you have more than one particle and maybe not have randomness, but interactions between the particles. So quantum dynamics of many body systems. And it was already mentioned that, uh, for instance, deriving the Boltzmann equation. Now, this is a nonlinear Boltzmann equation with, uh, with, a, um, with a, a cubic nonlinearity. That's still an open problem. And uh, in fact, some of the techniques we have here apply. Because you, uh, if you think back to this introduction which I gave you, you can cast it into the form where you have this expansion in loops and in path vertices with a, with a certain average. And um, one can sum use some of the bounds here. But uh, um, yeah, 
we don't have a, a result where we can say that we have something on the kinetic time scale, but certainly this can be used on a technical level uh, to also address that problem. Okay, th then I think I, I've said enough. Thank you. Are there any questions? No? Yeah, can you explain once more how you count the degree of the permutation? Yeah, so the degree of the permutation here would be you have three ladder indices here, yeah, and the total permutation is one, four, seven. Seven minus three is four. Okay, and if I have another ladder, I would just subtract. Yeah, yeah. Of course, in this picture, it's extremely hard to see, but if you go to the permutation picture, it's very easy because the ladders are just, uh, uh, um, in the graph, there's just slope one increasing or slope one decreasing pieces, and, and you just take them out. But I find strange that that's, uh, I would have just uh, replaced those three by one because they, they are parallel. But I, I, I find it strange just to remove three and not remove two. Oh. Because still we have a crossing between these three parallel lines and the other one. Yeah, okay. Yes. Maybe one can try to optimize it in this way, but... Uh, just think... Yeah. Um. Yeah. Actually, you're right. An index is two. Uh, the index is two because this index here is not a ladder index because ladder index says uh, pi of j plus one is pi of j plus one, or if it goes the other way, it's pi of j minus one, yeah. And um, if you now look at this one, this is obviously not the case, yeah. Yeah, so, so sorry if it is too naive, but if the lattice model is so much harder to deal with the continuum one, what is the motivation for doing the lattice on top of the continuum? Well, the motivation is maybe that the lattice problem is so much simpler to formulate and it's a, it's a well-known problem, the Anderson model, right? I mean... Uh, for, for this... Uh, quantum diffusion, yes, I, I think, I think it's just just a question what whether you what what community you would like to address, right? I mean, if you want to talk to condensed matter physicists, uh, they are all used to these lattice models and Anderson models, so it's a it's a it's a problem that you can formulate sim simply, and you want to have an answer, so it's interesting to know. If you look at other problems, uh, as I mentioned here in in this. Um, it's actually, uh, if you really think of physics, then, then lots of interesting things that are going on right now are in the non-continuum case, where you have all these level sets which are non-convex. I mean, the anti-high TC uh, superconductivity theory is, is in that range, right? It's not described by any continuum model as far as we know. Um, but for this here, yeah, it was just, we wanted to include the Anderson model. Yeah? Uh, I, I think this question is also very naive. Mm -hmm. and so, so when, when, I mean, you just talked about those level sets and yes. how to extract the decay and the, the form of them is difficult. And 
I can imagine, I mean, the dimensionality of the level sets, this I right away see, and that, that there's some regularity needed in order to look locally. But, um, but when, you, when, you, when you say, so, so, you, so, you, so you seem to extract something more from the Fourier transform beyond that. I mean, more than just regularity and the dimensionality. Is there an easy picture? Why this is necessary? How one can do this? So the easiest picture is probably to go to position space and then the, and then if you look at the Fourier transform of such level sets, uh, the question is how fast do they decay? Yeah. And they're really the shape is also... I mean oh yeah, of yes, of course. Yeah, I mean, this is standard down. harmonic analysis. Yeah. It's, it, it is, it is uh, very important what the shape is. Especially if your curvature vanishes, then, then your decay gets a lot slower. Yeah. Okay. And I mean you can actually rewrite some of these estimates just directly in position space, for instance these recollision estimates. And so then, then it's directly a question whether certain powers in, uh, you know, of, yeah. of, of the, the propagator, absolute value are summable, so it's an LP question. And, and, okay. and these things very strongly depend on what your curvatures are actually. It was surprising to see how, how little is known in general. So, so, so the convex, non-convex is mainly a question with the curvature in the end? Yeah. Okay. I mean, the convex, non-convex is also, I mean, curvature plays a role, but you remember we had this vector Q and when you have, whenever you have a, a, a Q which, which um, for which part of the of the level set becomes congruent to to the untranslated one. Yeah? For instance, in the square case, you have lots of such cues. Then then uh, everything changes very much. I mean, decay changes, and all all these estimates change. These are n very well known cases. For instance, if you look at the equilibrium cases, this is the famous half filled Hubbard model with all its peculiar properties. Yeah. And and so, uh, yeah, it's basically, it's it's one of the crucial things in, in all this. Uh, so, but if you would then like to uh, go to a longer time scale, the next class of diagram to resum would be the would it be the would, would it be the ladder or? Yeah, this is this. Uh, this is actually what's described in this Hikami paper. So it's it's some kind of twisted ladders which you have to resum. Yeah. So you know the the, the 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 you can take the ladder and twist the bottom line so it gets. And uh, naively you th you'd think it has a lot of crossings, but in fact it has only a single crossing. Uh, if you think of, of, of the permutational classification, so that's down by a factor one over t, but not more. And if you want to go to a longer scales, you will have to uh, look at these diagrams too, but these are not the only ones. Uh, so I, I unfortunately cannot tell you which ones you all need. Uh. But this would amount to a dress, it would not amount to a dressing of the, the propagator, no. right? It's no. a redefinition of the coupling somehow. Yeah. Uh, I see. Yeah, I mean, here the nice thing is if you just have to do it with the propagator, you can, uh, you can do it all before you take averages. Yeah. And that's over there. Yeah. Thanks. <coughs> Any other questions or comments? No. Just the last question. So somehow when you realize what you are able to do is to take uh, into account part of the limiting equation, which is the, the loss term. And so somehow you describe something which is supposed to be closer from uh, the dynamics and just uh, this this uh, this uh, brute uh, perturbation uh, theory where you just expanded the this domain. And so would it be possible to include more of the of the limiting equation so that so that essentially the error term should be smaller. Uh, I think it will be possible, <laughs> but, 
but uh, are you asking will it be possible in this expansion? Maybe yes. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm doing something else on this expansion. I don't know. This is what I mentioned as the nonlinear sigma model. If you do if you do diagrammatic expansions for these, you you actually resum a lot more stuff. But these things are uh, mathematically not under control yet. But I agree. I mean, it's it's uh, for uh, one would hope for a more elegant method. Yes. And the, the, the spirit is certainly that you identify what, what the important things in the equation are and then you modify your expansions uh, in, in this way. But uh, there is no claim that this is the, 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 this is the path to, to doing the problem uh, on longer time scales. It's on the other hand, it's also not completely hopeless and uh, yeah, it was supposed to be an invitation, but I don't think I've invited many people. Okay, <laughs> any more questions or comments? Then thank you monthly for the very nice presentation. <laughs>